Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. We have two special guests, Joe Green and Richard Bartholomew. We're going to talk about one thing. Actually, we're probably going to talk about a lot of things because that's how my show goes. But it's a pleasure to have you guys back on the show. Joe, it's great to see you, man. Um, how are you doing? And Rich, I'll ask you how you're doing next. <laughs> I'm doing good. Glad to be on the show, man. Rich? I'm doing great. Glad to be here. Your hair looks amazing. Oh, thanks. I'm not doing anything. I'm not trying to look good or anything. I'm I'm on a haircut strike. Why are you on a haircut strike? <laughs> it's better than a hunger strike. I'm trying to get somebody to do something, and I'm not going to do it. They're not going to do it, uh, and I'm not going to cut my hair until it happens. Wait, what's the thing that they got to do? Uh, you don't want to get into that. Okay. That's it's fair. a haircut strike. Okay. And it, it could easily go another year, so be down to my back. This is the longest, by the way, it's ever been. I had it was a little shorter than this my senior year in high school. But that's getting that now. I'm I'm past the threshold now for milestones. It's time to break out the old varsity jacket. But I'm I'm feeling like you Rock know Salvador roll. Dali, Native American, you know all that. Okay, don't say that. We'll get canceled. Um, I I called you guys together because I've been trying to get this uh pulled together for a long time to us finally talk about space. Um, cause you guys have different opinions and perspectives. And I'm in the beginning, I was kind of more in the boat of the a little fun topic I've said with astrophysicists and many other people that I thought that the moon landing, we didn't land there when we said we landed there. Um, I thought it was a big thing to try and win the cold war. Um, cause the country really needed it at that point. But then through the past couple of weeks, I've been doing a lot of my own research, um, and looking through just a bunch of video footage and everything like that. And I come out with not necessarily a different perspective, but I think there's a lot of things that just don't make sense that were really never explained. Certain individuals that voiced an opinion that was a little bit different than the official. Um, and then also, the, it, it seems to be just like kind of similar to the Kennedy assassination was there's a lot of people that were doubting the government's credibility in that aspect of things. And maybe that might just be a long haul of the 60s. But I wanted to get your guys' opinions of it. I'll start with you, Rich, because I know you side more in the realm of uh, – we went to the moon, even though we lost the technology to be able to do so, uh, which is a little bit weird. But we can get into that. But, Rich, give me your perspective. Why are you such a uh, a fan or a patriot of we did go to the moon? Um, I'm a, you know, I'm an advocate of we did go to the moon because we went to the moon. Period. Um, I wrote an essay. Um, it's on my Substack, Bartholomew.substack.com. It's called Apollo Denial, the Moon Landing Hoax Hoax. I made the whole case there. It's solid. It's easy to make. Boom. Footnoted everything. Go to the websites I footnoted. Go to the videos I footnoted. It's all there. I'm just winging this, but everything I'll try to remember here is in that essay. And, you know, I, it's nailed. It is just nailed. We went to the moon. It was easier to go to the moon than it was to fake it. Now, but there's a caveat to this. There's a but. <laughs> we didn't go to the moon the way most people think we did. Yeah. And the hoax, the hoax is a conspiracy in itself. The idea that we didn't go to the moon is a hoax because they don't want you to know that we actually did go to space way far more than people know we did the secret space program now if you don't believe we can go into space that cancels you from talking about the secret space program which was the purpose of creating the moon landing hoax and it started by the way a guy at nasa the day they're holding a press conference either right before the launch or the day of the launch that morning and they're holding a press conference and a guy some some guy walks in and he's handing out flyers. That's all about the moon landing hoax. And that's how they did it. That's how they started it. Uh, it was NASA themselves who started the moon landing hoax because they wanted to make sure that, you know, if somebody accidentally heard some audio when they went to a different channel and stuff and talked about stuff that you weren't supposed to hear and started putting two and two together, uh, they wanted this backup conspiracy theory so that they could cancel people they could drag you into it it's a straw man argument they could drag you into it and cancel you make you believe that we can't go into space and it was all filmed so that they could keep you out of the argument 
that there's a secret space program, which there is. Okay. Joe? That's my basic case right there. Joe, did you have anything on that or did you want to share your perspective? So, first? um, I mean, that's the, the caveat is, is, uh, uh, very well said because it's certainly possible that there is a secret space program and, and there's, they're getting there some other way that we are not privy to. I mean, that's always possible. Um, and I also want to say that, uh, you, like you guys kind of talked about it, uh, kind of brought this up last time that I flirt with certain ideas. And that's true. I do flirt with certain ideas. And this whole discussion is fundamentally, I would say, less serious than when we're talking about like the Kennedy assassination or something else. Um, that's why I really I really haven't written about this. Um, but here's here's some of the, the things that I take issue with. And it's really not even, I don't even really think necessarily that we didn't go to the moon um what i would say is that the evidence that has been presented is highly lacking and i don't blame especially young people for saying this looks ridiculous because it does look ridiculous and so it's not it, it, i don't i don't think it's i don't think it's stupid to question what we've been given because what we've been given does appear to be preposterous fundamental thing the thing that gets me going is okay so when i i went to college i had two roommates and they were both engineers okay one was a mechanical engineer one was an electrical engineer and i'm the kind of guy especially when i was young like i read every book in our house when i was a kid because it just there's not enough stuff for me to read and i grew up literally on a college library so i could go to the library and just read everything in the damn library well we went to college uh, I I read all the books for my classes, and so I just started reading the books for their classes. Because, like, like I say, I just read any damn thing. And one of the books that really made an impression on me was by this engineer, and it was called something like "The Sadness of the Engineer" or something like this. And it was written by a guy who had built a, I think it was like a hotel balcony or something that collapsed. Okay, and it was about how he felt about it and what led to those like what mistakes he made and as you know engineers over engineer everything that they build right so if you're building a bridge the golden gate bridge the idea is we have to uh create tolerances so that the bridge can sway appropriately when necessary to to let the uh, kinetic energy go uh it has to to carry 10 times more than we ever expect it to carry and so on and so forth the same thing is true with like high rise buildings, all kinds of stuff. They overbuild everything. Okay. So when the NASA engineers were getting ready to send us to the moon, they had enormous technical problems. So this is, a, you are building for, a, 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 you're, you're going to send a rocket into a place that has no atmosphere. Um, and you've got to keep human beings alive and not cook and not frozen and breathing. And you got to send them to a rock that has no resources whatsoever. You have to land it, you have to get it back. Okay, very extraordinarily difficult to impress. When they were testing the LEM, um, they tested it one time and it almost killed Neil Armstrong. It went crazy, Never, it never worked on earth. Yeah, the simulation, the simulation on earth, I, I, I read. It probably. never worked, okay. They then sent that limb to the moon where it worked perfectly. I don't believe that an engineer would do that. That an engineer would say, okay, based on that test that almost killed Neil Armstrong, everything's cool and we're good. Um, they also had another significant problem, which is that the fuel that is used in these rockets, it's a hypergolic fuel, which destroys the, it's a one use engine. You can never use that engine again because it's going to get wrecked after after you use it right and so again, same same problem you're building a rocket you're going to take it to the moon you're going to land this thing on the moon somehow and then you're going to press a button to ignite those hypergolic the uh, fuel and if it doesn't work they're all going to die right and you can never test it 
not only can you it's it's not that you can you can it's not even theoretically possible to text to test it because you can't go to the moon and do a test right we cannot create the type of uh, vacuum that is in space we can create similar vacuums on earth but not near as powerful which you can find out by by looking up that that information um i have trouble with that i, I have trouble thinking that engineers would work i would think that an engineer working on this would say we're going to kill three dudes this is what we're going to do like i don't like the chances of of us uh, su successfully doing this uh, are very very low almost miraculous and we know that that's why the russians didn't do it um the russians of course you know everybody knows about yuri gagarin um he was allegedly the first man um but he was the first man that survived Right. And we know this because there were a couple of Italian ham radio operators that were, were listening into Russian transmissions and they were they killed a number of astronauts trying to, to get out there. Um, and that wasn't even to go to the moon. That was just to, to go out there. It, it's so I, I don't think most people have an, any idea how difficult it is to do this stuff. Right. The only missions that have ever claimed to send human beings actually into space. Um, are the moon missions. All of the space shuttle missions, those are well within Earth's atmosphere, right? Those only go about 200 to 400 miles. And they have to be very careful uh, because even going up 200 miles, you have to watch out for the sun. A in fact, this is true of planes. When you ride in a plane, you get essentially an X-ray whenever you ride in a plane. And there are times when the sun is highly reactive um, that you have to be careful and they will adjust how they fly based on that and definitely true of the space shuttle the international space station those sort of things um space is just extraordinarily dangerous so i'm i am um i am sympathetic to anyone who is skeptical of that claim it's not so much that i particularly say you know that we didn't go to the moon or whatever um but it is it, it, it sort of reverses carl sagan's thing right the idea is that if you're making uh uh a extremely an extraordinary claim you have to have extraordinary evidence the extraordinary claim is getting a human being into space alive and bringing them back and then and getting a human being into space alive getting them to the moon and then bringing them back so with those extraordinary claims i would expect to have extraordinary evidence and i we don't have that in my in my opinion i um sense? yeah i want to divide the factor here of like there's there's a line where people go space isn't real and then there's a line that like that's 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 what we're not talking about this what we're talking about is that there's a healthy sense of skepticism because there have been some things about it that have not been reasonably explained um for instance i i never didn't know about the whole moon hoax thing created by nasa type deal i never it makes a lot of sense when you kind of start explaining that a little bit, but mainly because I just looked at NASA's budget and I'm like, what the hell are we doing here? Because there's a lot of money and I'll pull this up if every if we can show this on air as well, too. But it's just the budget is ridiculous for what they're costing for either thrusters, rocket, just any parts. Is Everything is super, super expensive. And we have a huge crisis where there's a homeless population. There's other things that we could be funneling that in towards. So – but the question that was mentioned way earlier in the beginning that was about it takes way more to fake the moon landing document wise and all this. When I go, didn't they do that with like the alien stuff for the longest time? I mean, they completely just have millions of documents that say there's no existence of UFOs and everything like that. And then within the past two years, that has completely changed our whole discussion to the point where now we're researching into UFOs and we've done a complete 180. So that argument, and I've, I've heard that point and I've kind of thought about that. I was like, well, that really doesn't work anymore in today's context. But I also think like, especially if you look at like the... I, I wouldn't say mismanaged, but I mean, the real clear people that had voicing opinions um, about either that we didn't go to the moon or that there are some things that just didn't make sense about it. I, I've looked and I will pull up a uh, thing if you guys want to see it, but it does mention what uh, Joe Green was talking about with the simulation thing. But this is from a documentary that came out, and I think it's pretty important just because the what this guy was connected with. Uh, he was, I guess, I'm just going to play it. He'd be able to explain to himself a little bit more, but 
to let me know which screen. Should be a picture of a cat. Did it pop up yet? No, it's spinning. Oh, there it is. Okay. In the 60s, Bill Casing was the head of technical publications for Rocketdyne, the company that helped manufacture the Apollo rockets. Casing, who claimed he had access to some of its top secret documents, questioned the competence of the Apollo project. I really believe that they weren't in the command capsule at launch. They, uh, they did a little bit of a magician act with the astronauts. They went up the elevator, but they came down the elevator. In other words, they did not want to risk the lives of the astronauts in case the Saturn blew up. An explosive claim, which Casing said the CIA tried to silence by making three attempts on his life. Like Casing, Marcus Allen, British publisher of Nexus, a magazine of alternative politics, history, and science, also questions NASA's engineering capability at the time of the launches. The problem is the whole Apollo program was a complete fabrication in order to be seen to succeed in the Cold War. The myth of Apollo is what is holding NASA back from future space travel. It's a tragedy. We didn't go the first time, we can't go now. We've never been. They lied to us. So, I mean, like when you start kind of like examining it from like Cold War context, which I've tried my best to learn more about the Cold War just in relation to the Kennedy assassination style thing. I mean, I think we went to space 100 percent. I think we went to the moon. Sure. But I just don't think we did it when we said we did it. I think that there was probably like because it goes from that argument point, which is why would they in a simulation if there was a huge issue, why would they risk? knowingly risk three lives by sending up a rocket with the possibility that it could explode or something bad could happen. It would make more sense to just launch a rocket. And then we have connections with Hollywood or the government has had connections with Hollywood for a very, very long time. I mean, Stanley Kubrick's name comes up and I don't necessarily look into the specifics of Stanley Kubrick. They could have gotten anybody to do something like that. But you look at some of that footage, the flag waving, which people mention, but also there's no stars. You know, you just see Earth. There's a little bit of like some serious questions that probably should have been addressed by anybody at NASA or by anybody that might have – instead of you get someone that says – it makes a claim about this in front of Buzz Aldrin and Buzz Aldrin just punches the guy right in the face. Like of course the conspiracy like side is going to start ticking up more because now people don't really trust you. And I think with the access of the internet and so many other things, obviously there's this word disinformation and misinformation that gets thrown out there. I'm sure there's some Russian disinformation 100 percent, but you really start examining just very simple things you can watch with your own eyes that you there they haven't really been fully addressed and it kind of answers a bigger question of conspiracies now not relating to the kennedy assassination but just talking about the moon landing here this is more of a fun one this is one where you can kind of have a good chat about it like we're doing now this isn't a debate this isn't any of that we're just talking about some things that they, it looks weird and then some explanations of it as well too and i mean you can probably explain away a lot of these things but nobody who has the position of power has bothered to do that which is the issue here well there is a guy who does uh richard do you know his, his name there's a there's a guy who has a website which is semi-endorsed by NASA. He doesn't work for NASA, allegedly. Um, but he does answer these questions, like the no stars thing. I'm not saying that they're, they may be good answers, they may be bad answers, but NASA does have a guy who does try to answer some of this stuff. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know if this is the one you're talking about. But this is the one that I reference in my article, uh, cleviusbase.com. I think I think that's a yeah. He, yeah, I he's not affiliated one. with NASA. He says he's not affiliated with NASA, you know. Um, yeah. but it goes. It's the most in-depth website that was devoted to this from the start, and it's designed totally to deal with every single issue. And I reference. I only went into one specific uh, area. The, the only one I think you need to do to prove we went to the moon. That's the gravity issue. And he does an excellent job with that, but he does an excellent job with the photos. He does an excellent job with with uh, the, whole, the whole bit. Now, I'm not saying that all of it's 
<laughs> correct because it's the straight story of how we went to the moon it's the nasa story of how we went to the moon uh i think we're, we're all in agreement that there's some fishy sides to this uh, and and budget wise i don't think it gets into budget stuff except for the straight you know official story of the budget but the whole thing about budgets you know they're talking they're they're dealing with it in congress um and they're always threatening to it's going to shut down the government but this is all nonsense there is you know where's the how how many trillions went missing from where is that you know there is a there is a, a black budget we have no idea we have no zero bupkis idea how much money that is some people uh Catherine austin fitz have delved into that made some good arguments richard dolan has uh has credited her and talked about it but you know if we're talking about a secret space program and dolan richard dolan who's i think the best historian on the whole ufo uh issue um he's written like he's he's on the third volume now of uh ufos in the natural security state uh like an encyclopedic uh you know project that he's doing and he's doing it in a perfectly scholarly way too and he posits a breakaway civilization it, it goes to that level and if we're talking about if, if we're just talking about the secret space program which we are because even if you go with NASA's story that they eventually declassify, there's a Nova episode that I referenced uh, about sending spies into space in the mid '60s to photograph. You know, Russia was doing it; we were doing it. We had no idea it was happening. You know, it was top secret. Now, what's the military done since then? <laughs> you know, we hear about what NASA's doing; they pretend to be public, but they do plenty of secret stuff even straight and narrow secret stuff, but they're doing secret stuff that's out there. Um, let's get this out of the way. I wanted to, I, I think when I was talking to Robbie about this, you, Robbie said that, you said that you have experienced a UFO, you think, uh, but Joe, you have, you've never like solidly seen something right before your eyes that you know. Yeah. So I have twice. So my perspective is totally different. In fact, that was the moment that I realized that there's stuff going on that we're not being told about. <laughs> and you know, you don't see the world the same ever again after that. I do not have the skeptic. I don't I don't have the luxury of skepticism. That's the way I put it in the article. Um, once you've seen one of these things right in front of your face and you know it's real, like like we're watching this now. Um I mean, but see, you guys, you guys could be deep fakes now, but see, I know my tripod is real. I know my phone is real. I know this chair is, is real. As, as far we won't get into the philosophy of reality, but there are things that you count on as real, like this chair. And when you see something like that in front of your face and you know, you know, you're not dreaming, you're not hallucinating, then your perspective changes and you know that there are stuff going on uh, there's a there's a great line at the end of, of the movie Diner. Ever seen Diner? Uh, yeah, at the end of it, uh, uh, one of the characters says to another, one, "You ever get the idea that there's stuff going on that we don't know anything about?" <laughs> yes, every, there every is. day of my life. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> so every, everyone should watch Diner. So yeah, Barry oh, Levinson, and, terrific. Oh yeah, everyone should watch Diner. It's well, a... You mentioned gravity, but can what when they returned, um, when they landed in the water and they got picked back up, they walked off like it was nothing, like they hadn't been in zero gravity, like they were just completely fine. But I think in, in the Apollo thirteen one, there's a, there's another moon mission that happened where the astronauts had to be carried out. So to me, it's just interesting, and, and the time wasn't that different, but their their fluctuation with gravity there, you know, they didn't have to adjust when they came back after the very first moon landing. Um, and I can I'll play the conference video here in a little bit, um, which also makes it a little bit more suspicious how their attitudes are completely different. Like you you were just in space, like you should be excited. Like I would be shitting my pants and drinking champagne and just be having a jolly day. Like show me some boobies, I don't know. But there wasn't any of that. There was this awkward like, what's the script and the line that I have to say? 
you know, and then even like the hand gestures and the movements of everybody is just a little bit awkward. Like you just want to space like America, apple pie, America is what you should be feeling right now. And that doesn't, that's not what I'm picking up from this. And I know you can be like, oh, that's, you know, that's just hearsay. It's like, well, look at it. You can, we'll, we'll watch it and you'll see that there's just a little bit something off. Like, I feel like you'd be a little bit more jollier um, than the way that they were asking. Uh, see the interviews with the William Shatner after he went up and Bezos is right. He was, he was also depressed. Yeah. Well, no. Well, no, he was he was the actor who went up. Uh, Robbie, you, you refer to the movie Apollo 13. Yeah, they show stuff in the movie that they didn't even film. Well, they didn't publicly film taking him out of the capsule. Uh, uh, also, the Russian astronauts are always they have film of them being carried out. They land on the ground. Uh, but uh gravity wise there's a t- there's a period of adjust adjustment um you know look at the uh, space station astronauts who are up there for you know weeks months years uh, and they have they the have bone to- density loss i mean it 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 does look like long term we we are not built to be in outer space and and these guys that we're talking about i mean technically they're past the carmen line but they're not what most people think of as being outer space. Cause again, it's like 200 miles up. It's not. Well, you get like the bends apparently. Total agreement there. I'm not sure about uh, that. I hadn't heard that. Well, they're the supposed way. to go in one of those chambers to like decompress or whatever it is, or adjust um, much like when you're scuba diving, you get like the bends. If you go up too fast, that's kind of what they have to do in, in a similar situation. It's kind of like that. Their bones have to adjust. Yeah. We're not built to be in space. We're not built to live on the moon. We're not built to live on Mars. I don't see that happening. You, you, you listen carefully to the, ex, the the real experts, the best people who know this stuff, and they'll like throw in there. They'll be talking about, oh, we're going to Mars. We're going to the moon. We're going to go to the moon first and then go to Mars. They'll throw in there. Yeah, but we, we have no idea how to live on Mars. We don't know physically if we can even do it. And that's when they're being honest. But because physically... You know, even if we get there, it's going to be like Jamestown. They're all going to die. You know, there are microbes. There's no way you can convince me there aren't microbes on Mars. There's micro microbes in the Antarctic. And I tell people who say, oh, I'm going to volunteer and I'm going to go and live on Mars. I say, you know what? Spend a year in Antarctica and then come back and tell me. You live on Mars. Because <laughs> the coldest day in Antarctica is the hottest day at the equator on Mars. I mean, if you can if you can live in isolation in a building and with gear when you go outside in Antarctica uh, for a year, then I'll be convinced that you will volunteer to go to Mars. Well, the way that they train people now is they go to – there's a base in Hawaii where they just take people into these little camps where it's like a – three or four different people. Um, and everyone's got like a specific thing to them. It was in the movie or not movie, uh, TV show space force, but it is a real thing. Like if they have a psychologist there, they try and change out the operators, whoever would play Houston, the ground office that talks to these people who is, they try and change them out either every two weeks or every three weeks. Um, just so you don't get like, I don't know, some type of connection or something like that with the person there. It's a weird way that how they do this, but it's trying to see if someone could last and be able to, if they get sent up in space, would they go crazy? And citizens aren't just, they're not ready for that. They're not able to function. I mean, going to a hotel sounds nice, but then you realize, holy shit, I'm in space. Like there's nothingness, there's nothingness upon endless nothingness that is expanding into more endless nothingness. Like that can drive a person up the wall and you know, there's, I mean, I don't, I think the future technology would be for like digital children, which is like just our AI or whatever we want to send up into space that goes on non-man shuttles, basically, you know, to go out into the world. And I, I've talked to scientists and researchers about that before, but the idea of the human civilization expanding out, I just don't really see that as a possibility, especially for extended period of time as um, there's a movie called Boy from Mars, if you've ever heard of it. Um, Basically, a colony happens on another planet, Mars, and the, there's a child that's born on Mars. Well, he's only adjusted to that climate. His body has – like Superman, when he comes to Earth and he's lived and he's got used to the conditions here, and when he goes back home to Earth where he's never been before, he just dies after like a month. 
because his body couldn't adjust to the different, uh, the stronger gravity and different conditions and everything of that sort. So it's just a weird discussion, but it's interesting how like there's a lot of research now and talks about space colonies and things of this sort. Um, even the, you know, the whole weaponization of space as well too, which is the only reason I think that we're never going to actually fully have hotels and you know, peace on other planets is because we're already thinking about weaponizing it. I mean, for the longest time they tried to, blow, or there was an idea of blowing up the moon with a nuclear weapon just to show how badass we were. And then someone was like, Hey, we can't that do was, that. That was one research. That was one paper. That was one scientist who floated that idea. I don't know that that ever actually caught traction anywhere, but, uh, uh, but uh, it, you, um, you know, it's funny you bring that up. Uh, but that was HG Wells, the war of the worlds that is what happens is that the aliens come down they start conquering us but they don't realize that the atmosphere is slowly killing them and eventually they all die because they they were not prepared for the conditions so i think that's a relevant point although um i think it's more akin to when people tell me or i read that they're going to live on mars i would say a comparable claim would be i'm going to be able to live in lava Okay. So if somebody came to you and said, I built this, this suit and, uh, and I've, I figured out how this material and I'm going to put a house in lava and I'm going to live in the lava in my suit. It's like, is there, what kind of evidence would you need to believe that that is even possible? Um, because I, I think, I think it's totally impossible. I think living on Mars is totally impossible. Have you yeah. seen the core? There's a movie called the core. <laughs> I've, I've heard it. I know what it is. I never saw it. I love that yeah. movie. It's very well done. It's a very well produced movie. They live in lava. Um, yeah. But you're at the very least, I agree, there you go. at the good, very good least, day. it's like they're saying, I could have survived the first winter in Jamestown. At the very least. Yeah, good luck yeah, with that. At the very least. Yeah. Here's another thing, too. And, and I, didn't, I didn't know this until I saw a NASA um, TED talk about the rocket equation it was called the tyranny of the rocket equation i would recommend anybody watch it. it's really interesting um because i knew when i was a kid and i think most people know that in order to get off the earth you have to go eight miles per second right or seven miles per second eight kilometers per second i think is uh, but i remember i think it was in a michael crichton picture or something when i was a kid that i saw but seven miles per second that's what you get but what i did not realize is that if you're, you're trying to get somewhere it's even worse than that. So when they were going into the moon, it's not seven miles per second, it's nine or whatever it is, 10. Uh, and if you're trying to get to Mars, it's an exponent because you're, you're trying to get off the earth to go to Mars. And like, it's, it's already impossible. And that's basically, that was, the guy is a representative of NASA. You'll see him all over the place. I can't think of his name right now. Um, he looks like a saddle. He looks like a saddle. I'm not sure. Maybe. He, he's the, he, he pops his up face in a lot is of the videos. definition of leather. I can tell you that. Like he needs to put on sunscreen. <laughs> I, oh, yeah, I, don't, Bill, I don't recall Bill that, but um, but uh, but anyway, he so and he's saying like you kids, you need to figure out how we can do this without rockets because we we are hitting up against a wall. We, in terms of because the, the problem is always you got to build a rocket powerful enough to get you off planet light enough so that you can have some kind of payload you can put people on there or something um and you're always having to do these incredible you know that you, you have to you adjust it by just a tiny bit and, and it means the rocket blows up or it never goes anywhere and it gets even worse the further out you're trying to go we just had one blow up here just a few miles from us yeah all the time. And that, and to me, that makes sense. So uh, when the 21st century began, uh, the guy, the virgin guy, Richard, whatever his name is, uh, was trying to start uh, the thing. And then Elon Musk is also trying to do this. Like, we're going to, we're going to make it like Disneyland. You get on a rocket, you go. And it's the same thing. All they're really trying to do is get into low earth orbit and they blow up rockets every week. You know, they, they have not had a ton of success. And they're not trying to get to the moon yet. They're just trying to get into low Earth orbit. And they're showing how difficult it is to do these things. They hardly ever get over the Carmen line. Yeah. 
so far it's an expensive roller coaster ride these little tourist trips uh richard yeah. garriott richard garriott the game richard creator. garriott richard garriott well i don't know if that's there's richard branson who did virgin uh, I was thinking of Branson. I, I you're, yeah, Branson, Richard Garriott is ultimate. Richard Garriott yeah. actually went up in a Soyuz and went into orbit. Uh, he got a better ride than the tourists or than the celebrities that are going up and down. That's a roller coaster ride. That's a amusement park ride. A fancy, expensive amusement park ride. That's all it is. So, what's the explanation for losing the technology to go back to the moon? Oh man, you had to have lived through the uh, the the downturn in the aerospace industry in the 70s there's a lot of movies about it. there's gidget movies about it you know there's like love boat episodes about all the aerospace engineers that lost their jobs in the 70s after we stopped going to the moon uh they built an in, a, a huge uh infrastructure and bureaucracy and then it all went away and i think it's more political than anything else but also uh <laughs> You could get into so much deep stuff here. Um, was Kennedy the only one pressing to go to the moon? Because it seems like um, there's a, I mean, I could play a phone call of Richard Nixon congratulating the astronauts um, for landing on the moon. So it, to me, that's just interesting, which is kind Warner of like. Von, Warner Von Braun was convinced, yeah. So he convinced Kennedy. Warner Von Braun convinced Kennedy? Von Braun was the guy, but he was the guy to go to. He was the guy saying, we can go to the moon. He, you know, in, in the late fifties, you know, Walt Disney did a whole thing. They introduced him to the public and gave him a platform to explain how we're, how we can go to the moon. Uh, Kennedy saw this as a way, you know, the final frontier, uh, hope, get everybody involved, feel good about our government. Uh, and you got to have a moonshot. They, they still, that's still an umbrella term today. You're going to cure cancer? That's the moonshot politics, moonshot politics. And that's a tribute to Kennedy. Kennedy was realistic. You know, he found out he did the, enough homework to realize this really is possible. We just need the will to do it. Uh, he didn't know the whole background of it. Von Braun probably did know uh, some of the secret technical issues. And so he knew we could go to the moon. He knew he could convince Kennedy we could go to the moon and hide the secret side of it. Yeah, but if that would have like blown up, like literally, that would have bounced on Kennedy, and then Kennedy would have been in a lot of shit. So he just didn't care about the ramifications. Warner Von Braun would have been probably exempt from that. Well, I mean, but that's not how you're selling it, right? You're selling we're making history. Right? We're we're taking we're doing this big thing, and it also relates to I think, uh, and it's, it's we're gonna. I'm only going to take a one minute detour here, but one of the things um, that will is is an instant help for any economy are large scale work projects, right? So, like for example, in Nazi Germany, right? Hjalmar Schacht, who had worked for J.P. Morgan, got some money together and said, "We're going to do public work projects. We're going to make the Autobahn." And we're going to make the Volkswagen, right? The people's car. And it worked. Like it does stimulate the economy. You have this thing. We're going to build this, they, this road and it's going to, you can go any speed you want on it. And we put people to work and they're also building infrastructure. So it's the same thing. Like when you're selling the idea of going to space, it's like, well, we're, you know, it's, it's the, the last frontier. We're going to build this thing. We're going to give people a lot of jobs. A lot of those jobs are going to be in Texas, which is, you know, gets in the LBJ stuff, but, um, and, uh, and so it puts people to work and it also gives us this thing that we are all focused on doing. We can inspire the hearts and minds of everybody with this project. So that's how you sell it. I mean, are people going to die? Probably like all, you know, every time uh, Vasco da Gama or somebody got on a boat and didn't know where the hell they were going on a ship, a lot of people died. That's just such as the nature of expansion um so it's not that surprising that people would die in the, in the course of, of the moon landing and it's actually one of the things that i'm surprised about because i would expect that the first attempt at putting people on the moon would result in everybody dying you know because 
it's it's a ridiculously hard thing we're trying to do. Yeah. Do you think that it's kind of like that long term goal thing was trying to a distraction to get people's mind off the political climate of the time? A lot of the issues that were going on. I mean, you got the Vietnam War that was going on. And then you had a bunch of things that were going on around that time period where I just feel like a lot of the public probably had doubt already about the government. And this was like how I bring up the morale part. No, no, they, the, the, and, and this is shown in Gallup polls. Um, the public distrust of government begins more or less with the Kennedy assassination and it increases with Vietnam. Yeah. It, no, it begins with the publication of the Warren Report, the chart continues up after LBJ takes over, it continues up for the rest of that year. Warren report comes out three weeks later, they take the poll again, precipitous decline that never, never recovered. That's not, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that. No, but, but, but you, but that's what Richard's trying to explain to you is that people were, we assume like almost everybody on, on the planet, whether they believe in quote unquote conspiracy, or not are deeply cynical about our government right they weren't like that before it wasn't like that so they it's not that you're dreaming up this thing to distract the public i, I think kennedy means it like you know we're gonna go do the thing not because it is easy but because it is hard right like he believes in that and that is a thing that makes sense for america to do because this is where you know, this is what we do. We're Americans. We roll up our sleeves. We do that, right? So he's buying into that stuff. It's things that we would assume are propaganda now. That is not the case. That starts with the Kennedy assassination, and more specifically, as Richard said, with the Warren report. Yeah, I don't think Kennedy was in on like this idea of just uniting the public on something. I meant like the, the other establishment parts, what I would metaphorically probably hint at it, the deep state. Um, rolling with it as well, too. I mean, I think the president has a lot of power to really spark up stuff, but I just think that to get the whole government to follow suit in that aspect of just building, you know, trying to focus on getting on the moon first, you know, I, I would think that there'd just be, since there's a lot of other espionage operations that are going on in other countries um, that we found out about later, I feel like that that would be more of their focus. Um, but I doubt the president knew about some of those things. Uh, I don't know. That's just my thoughts on it. It just seems like more of like you need, to just bread and circus is the whole metaphor here. You know, you need that kind of little bit of a thing. I think Kennedy was 100% sold on the idea of going to space. I heard him in his debates versus Nixon. I think that was the first time anybody has really talked like that ever. And I think that aired and or ushered in a new era of thinking for a lot of people. Um, but for the establishment, I mean, I just look at that like Kennedy was a good choice because he could distract the public while everyone's else working in the backworks. I mean, that might be my, like I said, my deep state brain moving a little bit, but I just think it makes a lot more sense. Yeah, there were there were the boys in the woodwork. They were always there. The covert ops, the deep state. Uh, they only got pissed off though when Kennedy said, "We're going to cooperate with the Soviets for a joint moon mission." You know, we're going to make this a global thing, not a U.S. versus the USSR thing. That's when they got pissed off. Uh, that just added to their anger against Kennedy. Uh, this was like November 13th when when he said this. And this around the time that uh, first 10 or so days of November, the first half of November, end of the first half of November, 63, Kennedy actually signs, he writes a letter to the CIA and says, you know, send all of our UFO files to Soviet Union. They're going to send us theirs. We're going to share this info. Oh, man. And Prouty told us how pissed off everybody got about that. Yeah, you, you really have to put yourself kind of back in the mindset of the people at that time, you know. So the idea is we're going to defeat the communists. And there were a lot of people in our own government and that worked at the Pentagon who thought Kennedy was a communist and started to say so openly. And we know that because of reports that came out later. Um, Martin Luther King supposedly was a communist funded by the russians and then later by the chinese right they're communists they are not they're not with us they're not on the team so that stuff is going on in the background the american people in general they are not attuned to that yet it's before 
it's because of the Kennedy assassination that people start paying attention to everything else that's going on. We had a s small period of relief from it when the Beatles came to America. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah. we were ready. Man, Beatlemania <laughs> hasn't happened since because we we spent a couple of months there totally, you know, in mourning. And man, we were ready to party by, by February 9th. And that had a lot to do with Beatlemania, I'm convinced. Hmm. I, I was there. That. I was there. I was yeah, sitting on the floor yeah. in front of the TV and watched the Beatles on Ed Stone. <laughs> well, were they, were they playing Love Me Do? Hell yeah. Uh, they, to a seven year, to a, I was, uh, I had just turned eight the day before. Best birthday weekend ever to this day. I got a Superman suit on Saturday for my birthday. I was a Superman <laughs> fanatic. You got a Superman suit, and I saw the Beatles on it. So, but they were just the floppy hair guys, you know. Oh, look at the weird hair, you know. To a set to an eight year old, that's all it was. And oh, why are those girls screaming? You know, I, if I had been like, but if I had been like, you know, even five, six years older, I would have been like everybody else. Oh, I got to grow my hair. I got to get a guitar. That's how you get the chicks. That's what happened. But everybody's ready to party. And that was the distraction from the Kennedy assassination. But it was temporary because it led to the whole distrust of government that Vietnam, when Vietnam comes along and right. Gulf we're, of Tonkin. We're drifting a little oh, bit right. from the space topic. So I'm just going to rip us back in here real quick. But did they ever <laughs> film that actual, like the footage? The footage of the whole space thing, landing on the moon and all that, was that actually broadcasted to people? Because there's an interview with Buzz Aldrin when he's on Conan, and Conan was introducing with a question, which was just, I remember seeing, much like everyone probably did, you guys land on the moon, and Buzz Aldrin could no, you didn't. You saw an animation. And he says that, which is just like, what is what does he mean by he saw an animation? That's true. I watched all the coverage. If I had had a mock-up of the command module, I would have been in that command module. There was a kid who did that. His dad built him one in the basement, and he spent the entire mission in the command module in the basement with the astronauts following their schedule, and I would have done that too. But I watched ev as much as I possibly could on the TV. And yeah, they, they're not prepared to show them uh, on TV, live TV on the moon. They had a little camera that was on one of the legs that, managed to get it working and it showed Armstrong fuzzy image saying the first words. And, but I, even I had forgotten about this, the up in the window, shooting out the window of the limb was a 16 millimeter and it photographed the entire EVA. Uh, you see it today and it's in fast motion because they wanted to extend it as long as they could and get as much footage. Uh, there are advantages to having it in fast motion because I was able to make a point about that in terms of gravity. But it documented the one six gravity and moving around in it. And you can't fake that. And nobody, Bill Cooper, uh, what was his book? The Riders on the Pale Horse or something? Uh, Behold a Pale Horse. Yeah, Behold a pale horse. Bill Cooper tried to make the case that um, they faked the gravity there, but you can't fake the gravity. Um, you can't fake one six gravity. You can temporarily, like they like uh, like they did in uh, Apollo thirteen, the movie. You can fake zero g for a few seconds with a parabola jet, um, but for hour for three hours of one six gravity, you can't do it. So that footage alone, and it's it's very good quality footage. It's high definition. You can find it on YouTube. I link to it in the article. Uh, it's it's one six. They're doing the work in one six gravity, uh, and I and I give the analogy of being an animator. Animators, uh, they don't just draw in two dimensions. They don't just uh, draw in three dimensions. They don't understand. They don't just understand things in two dimensions or three dimensions like a sculptor does. They understand things in the three dimensions, three space dimensions and time, because you have to understand motion to do animation and you have to so make it look, you know, believable. And there's a thing called secondary motion, 
And if you if you have created secondary motion in the job, being paid to do it, uh, and you have experience doing it, uh, you understand. You you see it everywhere. You can see it. You can see se secondary motion. Like I move my head, see my hair. The hair is the secondary motion. You have to animate that. On the moon, you see them moving their arms and legs, right? You see them grabbing stuff and moving that around. That's Their muscles are geared towards 1G, Earth's 1G. So that's normal speed. But they take something, they toss it, they, they throw it, or they kick something, or they fall themselves. That's not 1G, and there's no way you can fake that. They're, it looks like slow motion. But not everything is slow motion. If everything was slow, you know, they try to make the argument that, oh, yeah, they faked one 6G just by doing it in slow motion. No, because the, you know, their motions are normal speed while motions relying on gravity are slow. One 6G slow. That's impossible. Oh, let me correct myself. I made the argument in the article. It's not impossible. But uh, it's it's easier to go to the moon and photograph it than it is to fake it on a sound stage. Uh, I'm talking about, uh, you know, recreating uh, crashed UFO technology and using that. Anti-gravity is a thing. Uh, I, I <clears throat> referenced the book, The Hunt for Zero Point. If you haven't read it, get The Hunt for Zero Point by Nick Cook. And it's he was a he was a Jane's Defense Weekly journalist. He was like a straight arrow journalist, and uh, some buddies of his started like giving him articles from the fifties about hey, what is all this talk about zero point technology? You're into all this defense stuff, you know. So he got curious and he looked into it. He dug deep and wrote a book about it, and he discovered that yeah, uh, and sometime in like fifty seven, fifty eight, <laughs> there was a breakthrough in um, anti-gravity research. And only after that did things go secret. Like there's all these articles in all the science journals and all the newspapers, people talking about, oh, we're gonna get zero gravity, the Jetsons and all this. And then all of a sudden nothing after the breakthrough. And he makes a convincing, very convincing straight journalistic argument for it. Uh, and he has not, you know, turned that into a circus or anything, he stayed, fairly straight over the years he did a, a couple of new youtube videos a few years ago and then got away from that again but um it's good it's a good story and um you would have to use that technology you'd have to use that secret technology on a sound stage and you'd have to do it for hours and it'd have to affect everything on the sound stage not saying it couldn't be done but why do it if you could just get to the moon and do it <laughs> How long? Um, but what about the flag waving? It does wave. It waves when they're touching it, and that's secondary motion again. Uh, the the curves in it, they had it on a wire because they needed it to stick out for photographs. Uh, the only way to make it stick out, you know, if you don't make it stick out, you're in a vacuum. It's just going to be like solid, straight down, and like compressed. Like, uh, so they had to figure out a way to make it look like a flag. You know, it's a it's on wires, and you can tell that when, when they're like putting the pole or handling the pole, you know, those wires are shaking and the waves in there because they didn't straighten it completely out. They didn't make it out of steel or cardboard or anything or plexiglass. They, uh, they made it, it was a cloth flag. It was a flag, it was an official flag. And there are, there's a code of, there's a flag code. And if you don't follow the flag code to the letter, it's not a flag. It's not a U.S. flag. That's why you can get away with wearing shirts that look like the American flag. You can't, according to the flag code, you cannot wear the American flag as apparel. But people who wear the pattern on a shirt, that's not the flag. That's okay. So anyway, so it was a real flag, but they had to put wires in, the, in, the, in it throughout it to make it stick out for photographs. What about when they landed? Why? Why was? Why don't we see dust? Well, you you look at the footage out the window. Uh, when Armstrong says we're picking up dust, that's what dust does when you're blasting it with a thrust. Yeah, but there was no dust in the video that spread. They even talk about that as well too, and they made an excuse saying that um 
it was because they had shut off the thrusters or put it to such a low point that when it hit, it just barely tapped and landed. And they said you can even see that there is a little small print, but it doesn't really look like that. Like you can take a leaf blower and blow dirt and dirt will spread all around, but that wasn't like that with this. I forget the exact depth, but it was only like a couple inches, three inches of, of fine dust over the uh, harder ground. Um, and um, they got dust all over their equipment. They got dust all over their uniforms. They dragged that dust back into the limb with them. Yeah, and that's surprising too. Like the very first time you're going to the moon and you don't have a – your suit can account for all the dust particles and rocks or anything like that that could be in space that could puncture a hole or do anything of that sort. Yeah, they didn't yeah, I don't know. know if you... oh. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, Go ahead. I was just going to say, I, they, they, there are uh, models even in the 50s to try and account for that. There were uh, suits built into the ship that you, you would get into and you would walk, but it would still be connected. And that way you wouldn't bring in dust and other things and all these uh, stuff to the to the uh, capsule so that is a, i mean that is a real issue it was an issue that they thought about they did not want to get dust into the capsule and then i mean it, so if they were there then they definitely did they did yeah well that's known that's known that that was a and it was a, it continued to be a problem continued to be a problem you look at the later you look at apollo 17 you know, 15, 16, 17, they're like, their uniforms are dirty. They get like dust, it sticks to them. Uh, did you guys, did, <laughs> did you guys want to see um the panel thing? Sure. The Apollo talking about that? Yeah, I've seen that footage. You could probably just run it for a minute or so. Yeah, I know. Uh, it lasts sure. like 30 minutes long. We're not playing the whole thing. Yeah. Give me one second, and I'll pull that up right there for you, gentlemen. Have you ever seen this, Richard? It's the Apollo conference. Probably, but I don't know yet. Well, this is oh, when yeah, I yeah, say... I've seen, I know what you're talking about. I've seen this, yeah. This is when I say that the language looks a little bit funky. Stars? I don't recall seeing any stars. That one. Yeah, but it's 10 minutes. And I don't know what part he says, the stars part. But if you just watch it for a minute, you'll see that what we're talking about, the awkwardness. And I hope it's going to pull up. Let me know when it starts sharing on your screen. They do the limb, everything which I say to the ground, and vice versa. All the limb communications uh, go to Houston where they're turned around immediately and sent back up to me so that... Uh, they hear everything I say uh, within five seconds of the time I say it, and, and the reverse is also true. Now, the S-band is, is uh, operable any time I am within line of sight of the Earth, not necessarily the, the limb, you see, so that uh, out of each two-hour revolution, uh, you know, roughly 60% of the time I am in contact with the ground, and therefore I am in contact with the limb. In regard to seeing them, uh, I'm afraid my eyesight's not quite that good. They're, they're too small uh, to be seen from an altitude of 60 miles. There is a, a possibility, and we intend to explore it further, that uh, the limb itself will be visible from the command module. The, uh, the flat size of the limb uh, being made of a mylar substance which reflects sunlight gives us hope that, we, uh, that I'll be able to see a flash of light uh, at precisely the proper sun angles when I am nearly overhead. And this, uh, of course, remains to be seen. I have a question for Mike Collins. Uh, what will the uh, command module pilot be doing while the commander and the limb pilot are on the lunar surface? Will you be doing any special experiments of any type or not while you're up there by yourself? This is while they're doing the lunar surface. I, I heard yeah, this is not the, uh, this is not when they came uh, back. Are there, are there any Oh, uh, this is before. Before, yeah. I said yeah, this is before. Like this is not after things. they came back because that one is. It, don't don't worry about it. It's but I think most people who are interested in this topic will have seen it. It's they're they're. It looks like a wake. Like they're very somber, and they're answering the questions very quietly. And it does not have the what you would assume would be a certain degree of enthusiasm, having done something that nobody else has done. Um, and they do have that question. Well, once again, about, it's not What's that? 
Once again, it's not a movie. These are not actors. These are fighter pilots. These are fighter pilots. Uh, show me an instance where fighter pilots get dramatic. Uh, it doesn't happen. S uh, submarine commanders, <laughs> you know, in the military, uh, you know, normal airline pilots, uh, air traffic controllers, they don't get excited. And these guys, you have to remember, these guys, they've done this a thousand times, maybe 10,000 times in simulation. Uh, that's and things came up that they weren't prepared for. They had to they had to quickly figure out that the computer was uh, rebooting or something as they were trying to land on the limb. So this, this is the one. One we had uh, house cleaning to perform, uh, food packages, flight plans, and uh, all the items that we'd used in the previous descent to be stowed out of the way and prior to depressurizing the, the lunar module. Uh, it took longer to depressurize the lunar module than we had anticipated, and it also took longer to get the cooling units in our backpacks uh, operating than, than we had expected. In sum and substance, it took us approximately an hour longer to get ready than, 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 we, would, that, than we had predicted. When uh, when we actually descended the, the ladder, it found it was found to be very much like the lunar gravity simulations we had performed here on Earth. And no difficulty was was encountered in in descending the ladder. The last step was about three and a half feet from the surface, uh, and uh, we're somewhat concerned that. Uh, we might have difficulty in, in re-entering the limb at the end of our activity period, so we practiced uh, practice that before doing uh, the exercise. Their moods definitely the changed from when the one I just played a minute ago to that one. Not much. They, I mean, that's the thing, though. There are alternative explanations. Richard provided one, and I mean, there could, you know, that's why I don't, I don't really like doing, you know, it's like, watch this video and tell me what you think i mean who knows i mean there could be a hundred thousand explanations of why i agree in general that it looks peculiar because they're not even remotely excited about relating their experience but as richard said maybe because they're in the military they're you know. um i think some of the other things are a little more interesting uh, they're the oddities, like you brought up Buzz Aldrin, who does seem to be kind of an odd bird in general. But you know, do you think that's because of the space Masonic, stuff? Though? Well, I don't know, but they they were really he's really into Freemasonry, right? as were what? most of the astronauts. He's suing he, his kids right now. Sonic ritual on the moon. He did a he, he did said a little weird thing. things. He took a little symbol with him, and he did a little prayer i call it yeah you know but we ended up suing his kids because i think his kids you've probably tried to seen like... the the photograph you're on a delay joe just letting you know what put him in a... oh okay i'm sorry um the uh, photograph of the three astronauts sort of doing this prayerful thing with the pyramid you may have seen that there's a lot of there's a lot of and there's in a lot of that stuff is talked about in a book that I don't care for that much, uh, but it's uh, Richard Hoagland wrote a book called Dark Mission with uh, he wrote it with somebody else, um, and I Hoagland half of what he says seems to be disinfo, but there's a passage in his book Dark Mission that talks about all of the different symbolism that's involved in the Apollo missions, right? They all have these names that reflect ancient. Uh, religions and the fact that they all seem to be Masonic for some reason. Now, whether that's good or bad or whatever, but it is, it's peculiar. And if that's true, Artemis, the current mission is continuing that. Yeah. Cause Artemis is a, Artemis is a Greek God and Apollo is a Greek God. Oh, Artemis is the sister of Apollo. Yeah. No, the huntress. By, uh, by a uh, illegitimate birth. 
But is that just because that has the whole Operation Paperclip background of the space program? Like there is those that weird connection that is kind of shocking for a lot of people. I and mean, that's a lot of the ritualistic stuff that goes on with some of the Nazis. Um, so I'm just curious. I mean, the Nazis ran the space program. So it shouldn't be surprising that we would see Nazi iconography in NASA uh, because it's not just Werner von Braun. There was a bunch of people. There were Nazi scientists that were. Sorry, my cat is really active today. Uh, she that's not Izzy. What, that's not Izzy. That's the other. <laughs> she's a she's a new kitten that we have. All right, right. And therefore, come here, baby. She needs a little more attention. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I mean, the, the Nazi influence in NASA and the Pentagon in general cannot be ignored, for sure. Well, the, yeah, because you can argue that the Nazis started the space program. Absolutely. Well, Warner von Braun used to work at a rocket facility, and he would hang the five slowest Jews in front of his rocket facility. Penamunda, yeah. yeah. Penamunda. And, uh, but, you know... <laughs> Von Braun, once again, Von Braun was the guy. You know, he's the guy who knew how to build a rocket and make it work. And he's the one that had the vision to take those rockets as the way of getting into space. Uh, that all started with the Nazis at Penamunda. Why and, didn't he ever Hitler. bother to sign up to be launched into space? Um, hey, well, I you mean, know. I wouldn't expect that. Yeah, I mean, would you? I would expect that. Got, you spend half your time thinking about space and the ways to get there. I would think that you would want to, once a one one works or two works, you'd be like, hey, sign me up for the next craft out there. I'd like to go see what's up there. He wasn't cracking the rocks at Penamunda either. You know, he wanted to run the show. He didn't want to risk his life beyond what was necessary. Uh, you know, there, there are other people who can do that. You can get a test pilot for that. You can get a monkey. You can get a dog for that. You know, that's Nazi thinking. Do you think um, that we should have accepted the Nazis' research and Warner von Braun's help, or do you think we should have done it in a different way where we did it with our own scientists? So it's, a, it's a tough question, but I I know it's a weird one, but it's just one you really got to think about where it's like well, kind of like asking, um, – You're asking two guys. I, I would you... not have accepted – at the end of World War II – I gotta be honest. I'm I'm sending them all to Nuremberg. Like I don't. I'm not making deals with any of these. Like I, I there are no ex Nazis. Okay, for me. Uh, yeah, for me um, either. So for me either. There's no, gonna, yeah, there's there's no there's no way in hell. I was gonna say to to Robbie. That's a deal with the devil. Yeah. Well, that's what that's what kind of my my main question there is is that I mean I wouldn't I don't know because at at that point you really look at what it was I mean you can't take back what they did and if you're going to use this person's advances you know to help your betterment of like I mean you got to look at how they're thinking about every country has a gun point to each other's head so we got to get to the moon first or this type of aspect of things but yeah it's that it's it's a devil's bargain there because I mean it doesn't look good. Um, but also, we know that there's a lot of things that break the Nuremberg Code that the United States has been at fault for after Nuremberg trials had happened. And from what I've heard from a guy who did a documentary called Acres of Skin about um, Ohio Penitentiary and like what they were doing to prisoners over there, apparently the Nuremberg trials or the, that code was only supposed to be for like Germany and like the Nazis. Everyone else followed suit. Because they thought this is what everybody is going to be a new established rules, and that's how the United States gets out of some of their unethical procedures. Um, that's why we have a human rights eth ethics and oversight committee as well, too. But there's a lot of things where it's kind of like the legal speak, like how they have in documents that kind of like, oh, well, we actually technically don't fall under that category, which is like – I mean, I think that's the devil's bargain aspect things, which is you accepted the help of these Nazis and the work of these Nazis instead of being like, no, you're all bad and we're not going to be connected with you in any way to the point where now it's just became, yeah, it's something we really don't talk about. I totally agree with, with Joe. Everybody goes to prison. Everybody gets tried at Nuremberg. Nobody gets off. Uh John J. McCloy let him off. Uh, I think uh, I think Warren himself has something to do with the Nuremberg trials. You know, it's it's all blended together once you get to the Warren Commission, um, and it's the it's the foundation of the CIA. 
they brought Nazis over, they, the, the Gellenorg, they brought Hitler's top spy network over here to show us how to create the CIA. Uh, there, you know, that's all you need to know right there. So everything that's happened since, you know, and then they, they kept all that quiet. You know, we, we know about it, but they still play it down. They play it down big time. You know, they get confronted about it. Even people would confront Warner Von Braun. There's footage out there of him being confronted by reporters about his Nazi past. And he just expertly plays it down. He That was scripted and he, he played it perfectly. Uh, but that he, well, some of the biggest know, oil people in the world were connected to like some type of Nazi connection or something like that, like a Nazi friend. And, and you know what? They still are. And that's, I see that as the fundamental part of our problem, which is why you will always find in these podcasts with me a white rose. I want to send them the message. I am the white rose resistance. And you can guillotine me. You can do whatever, but I'm not going to. I will not stay quiet. Sophie Scholl, I will not, we will not stay quiet. We are your enemies if you are in the legacy of, of the of Project Paperclip, I am your enemy. But what about like just tearing I mean some of the foundations the stuff that has like probably the worst foundations possible like the CIA or other organizations that have such a dark history and entrenched history um wouldn't you I mean should we disband those and just make new ones on a better foundation a better past I mean you can't forgive doing what we've already done for the past however long I don't think we should ever forget or forgive any of it but it's also about like how do you try and wipe some of the slate when it comes to just getting on a better path of doing better. I mean, our, the whole space thing in general is completely, everything that we have has been from either Nazi invention or some type of thing like that when it comes to just getting into space. So you can't take that back. Even if we're building rockets that are completely separate from that, it doesn't matter. We, that's how we started and that's how it's going to go forward. It's like the very first car. It's like, if you mess that up with some type of deep wrong connection and every car afterwards, you can be like, yeah, but the very first one was, you know, made by a Nazi. So it's, it's, it's difficult well, to have that. I was just going to say Henry Ford was personally given the order of the German Eagle by Hitler. Uh, yeah. He also liked his book, Mein Kampf, uh, Hitler's little biography that he had. So it's funny you bring that up. Also, you, you got into my favorite question now, Robbie, you know, what are we going to do about God. it? But that is a bridge to cross. We're not at that bridge yet. I think we're close. But we cross that bridge when we come to it. We can't cross it now. Uh, it was interesting that Bobby Kennedy Jr. in his uh, announcement that he's running for president, he mentioned, uh, he quoted his uncle, JFK. Gonna, I'm going to split the CIA into a thousand pieces and scatter it to the winds. You know, <laughs> he said that out loud in a speech. Announcing he's running for president. Uh, nobody's done that. Not even Bernie did that. Bernie backed off of the idea of doing that. Uh, so here we are. So we're trying to get to that bridge. Uh, what do we do? That's a tough question. You know what? We're going to need a think tank to think about that. <laughs> but first, we have to get to the bridge. And everything we do now is to get to the bridge. We have to force the government to accept the conspiracy because without uh, as long as the Warren report is the official lie, there is no massive criminality. They get off scot-free. As soon as that is accepted as a lie and it is a conspiracy and everybody accepts that, then we have to do something about it. And then we're at that bridge. And then we need a think tank to think that through thoroughly. And we need somebody like Bobby Kennedy Jr., who's already thinking about it and probably has been for a long time. I'm not saying as president, I'm not endorsing. So people think you're crazy though. If you if you start endorsing, if you say if you start saying, I'm gonna send Bobby Kennedy some money, I mean you're canceled immediately. <laughs> and they're trying their best to cancel yeah. him. Just watch. It's a bad 
this is the most fascinating election period in a long, long time, probably since Bobby Kennedy. Yeah, I'm wor I'm worried. I am concerned. But fascinated, we'll see. right? But fascinated. but fascinated and more power to him. I mean, uh, I'm glad he's doing this. All but I'm saying is let's watch this closely and let's see what we can learn from it. What are your what is your take, Joe, on some of the secret society stuff that goes on, some of the roots that we got on it? I mean, you think that should be public knowledge? Um, like it should be taught in schools or something like that? I mean, we do have an issue with the skull and bone society and other things of this sort. So one thing I noticed, I was a private investigator for a couple of years. And um so I, I would go to I would go to the uh, police stations a lot. And I worked all over Texas. And then I would they would send me to Southern California. So I would go to Long Beach, LA, all the the whole LA metro area, right? Doing my thing. Um every single police station that I walked into um had a Masonic order plaque in the building that said which one they belong to. Um, you know, then listed the address of the place that they go and all and so when they, I got a new feeling about when they say the thin blue line about how police cover for each other, like it's, it's literally brotherhood. When they say a brotherhood, they mean a brotherhood because they join this Masonic fraternity. Um, I can't tell you that I don't think the world is run by secret societies. Not exactly. Uh, but there, you will definitely find people creating fraternities of their own, whether in the Ivy League or in the police, um, and then acting in accordance with that. If you want to say that that's conspiracy, I mean, that, uh, that's fine. Um, I'm just saying that that's what I observed. Also, there's a very good book by, um, it's called Fire in the Minds of Men by James Billington. A lot of right wingers like that book because uh, he's kind of a libertarian. But what he's talking about is the effect of the secret societies on both the U.S. Revolution of 1776 and then the French Revolution of 1789. And he draws some interesting comparisons because there are secret societies all over both of those revolutions. It's very interesting. It's a history that's worth knowing. I don't think uh, that the world's run by secret societies or anything, but I, I think it's. I think you need to have a rule where you can't have any people in positions of power that are connected to those types of institutions or anything like that, even if it's a fun getaway thing. I had a guy on here to talk about secret societies who was an academic and not into conspiracy theories, um, more just in the facts of things, of what we can prove. And when we talked about Bohemian Grove, I asked him about, like, don't you think that's weird? And he was kind of just like, I mean, they're just talking about like a pipeline in Russia or something like that. I was like, yeah, but it's in front of a, a fucking owl statue. I'm like, that's a problem. That's weird. Go to a hotel, order pizza. I don't care, but don't do it in the middle of the forest over tea or whatever you guys are doing over there. He's like, yeah, but it's just setting policy. I go, that's the thing, though, is that if you invite a business person, let's say a friend brings a CEO of a capitalistic business or something like that, comes in and that business now becomes entrenched into things that we would deem as things that shouldn't have capitalism entrenched into our health institutions, for instance, or anything that gives the public a certain comfort or connection to just being cared about as an individual, which we can see through a lot of things that I'm not going to talk about the pandemic, but there's a lot of issues that have been arisen that have been brought to the forefront that Bobby Kennedy is also talking about, which all the other people have been talking about for a very, very long time. And it's this connection that we start having. It never starts with, we're just going to bring in this company and we're going to use all their material for however long, and we're going to give them exemption from everything. No, but it starts somewhere and the goalpost keeps moving to a point where we're at now, where we got to start looking at cutting off ties. I mean, the whole medical institutions need a revamp and it's always kind of been crappy. It's not just pandemic related. There was Janine Jones, the angel of death who killed what they speculate upwards of 60 babies. And where why it says upwards of 60 babies is the records were destroyed. The hospital destroyed her records because they did not want to keep getting sued and going further investigations into it. So it was a medical scandal and they knew about it and they pushed her off to a different hospital where she eventually got caught. I mean, that's just an institution trying to 
keep their reputation intact. We have a large push in society for wondering or caring too much about our reputations. And I think that starts with when you start looking at business relationships, you start looking at connections and what your reputation can get for you. Look at the guy, um, what was his name? Bird, the guy who owned Texas School Book Depository and was always having like parties at his house and stuff. He had the six floor window in his house and you'd have people stand in front of it and take pictures. That's weird, that's, man. That's that's the story. Yes. That is the story. I, I don't know that that's confirmed. I don't, Richard probably would know. They, oh, no, it's it's true. Uh, that window, that original window is now in a little museum of uh, curios in East Texas. Um, I forget the name of the town. It's it's not as big as Longview, but it's it's in that area east of Dallas. Hmm. There was an article about it. You can find it. You know, Google the the six floor window. You'll find the article. Uh, and now I've written about David Earl Bird. See my article on Substack called "The Lies of Texas." I knew that dude before anybody knew him. <laughs> And I know people who knew him personally. Uh, I don't know. Robbie may not recognize the name Daryl Royal, uh, the legendary coach of the University of Texas Longhorns. But I know his son, Mac Royal, who worked at the LBJ Library for a while and uh, tried to do some stuff uh, to expose what's there. And they got rid of him fast. And he's got a fascinating story to tell. Sorry, Mac, if I'm talking out of line here. But uh, Mac and I've had some discussions. He's got the most fascinating family photos, too, that I've seen some of them, of Connolly, him, like, hanging out with Connolly and Bird and all those guys. It's just amazing. David Harold Bird, The Lies of Texas. So you can't deny when it comes to those connections that you're probably more likely going to look in the opposite direction when something might be a little bit corrupt or something might be a little suspect to the person that you're connected with. You bet. Yeah. Okay. Just, I'm just didn't know because we're in, like, like I said, coming from a more modern take on looking at the past, I'm seeing that this connection thing has just been going on for a very long time and we haven't bothered to really address those types of things. I started at the beginning of social media when I signed up for Facebook and Twitter. I decided the only way I can mentally deal with this <laughs> is just the, have the default position that I'm talking, I'm already talking to chat. GP, what became chat GPT way back then, 2000, uh, probably not till the end of, yeah, it was definitely after the end of 2010. Joe knows what I'm talking about, that whole scandal. Uh, I learned what people will do to you on the social media. Uh, and I decided, you know, until they prove otherwise, they're deep fakes. They're, they're, uh, cause you don't know. It, before the term catfish came along, I was already treating them like catfish. And then you have to prove to me. I have like 200 people in my friend request list on Facebook because, you know, if I don't know you, uh, and I'll even do a little research. And if well, you accept have, my friend request already. Jeez. Did you? Uh, I thought I did. Yeah, you I'll did. accept. I'm just kidding. Yeah, you, you crossed the threshold. I know you well enough to accept it. Thank God. But I, And I know other people. Uh, that I'm not quite ready because I look at their friends list. They're going to all hide their friends list from me now. Uh, and I see certain people that I don't want to associate with or who I have told them or they have told me not to associate with them. And if that's on their friends list, that's a possible connection back into that person. And I'm not going to connect with, with you, even though I don't have a problem with you. I have a problem with being connected through you to this other person. And so that's why I have 200 friend requests. That I'm not dealing with, but the, the that doesn't rule mean of th the rule of thumb is is that if you wouldn't wish them a happy birthday, then you don't accept the friend request. That's oh, the I go rule farther of thumb. with that. I go farther with that because some people, you know, they some people like to get happy birthday. Some people don't like to get happy birthday. Some people like it for a while and then don't like it and then like it again. So what I do is I look and see who who said happy birthday to me on my last birthday, and that tells me, okay. I owe you a happy birthday. That means that you you like getting happy birthdays. You like giving them. I'm gonna give you a happy Jeez, birthday. Jeez, man, that's some calculated shit. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's part of it goes into yeah. that whole thing. But now we have everybody's aware of Chat GPT. Oh, Chat GPT is nothing. Uh, you know, 
Japan and China and Google. Google, as a matter of fact, they have quantum computers. Come on, give me a break. The singularity is imminent. The technological singularity. If you don't know that term, look that up, boy. If you're this is you another to... this is another thing that Richard and I will have a disagreement about too. <laughs> what the technological well, maybe singularity? Not. Maybe not. I mean, we have areas where we agree. I mean, I think we fundamentally agree on the secret space program. Yeah, we agree on the secret. Oh, oh shit! <laughs> I was gonna. <laughs> I, I don't think there, I mean, there could be one. I agree there could be one. I don't think there is one. So that's At a difference. To the point that they were sending spies up in the 60s. I know, don't believe that. that. When you when you said that, I didn't. I don't know if I believe that. Watch the Nova episode, Secret Spies, uh, Space Spies or something like that. Nova. I mean, if we're talking about low Earth or orbit, yeah. Not past yeah, not, the planet. Not actual space. Yeah. Although, I, you know, it's funny. It, it, I, I a lot of this comes that, down to. I grant you that skepticism because you haven't seen a UFO. Yeah, this is true. I not not to my knowledge, um, but it, it, even the moon is within Earth's atmosphere, technically. It's just that it's very very you know it's the the atmosphere sort of extends out into, um, but I think most people have a, an intuitive idea of what space is, and it's not. Or the space shuttle and the eyes. Space is space. You're out there. Yeah. Yeah. No, we we do agree completely. That's what I was saying. That you know, you listen to the really honest experts, and they say we have no idea how to get to Mars yet. We don't. We don't know if we can survive such a trip. It may be impossible. The honest ones will say that out loud. More power. And to probably them. not. I agree. I say probably not. <laughs> uh, almost certainly yeah. not. So we agree there. Yeah, but no, okay. But um, what about actually going into space and landing on the moon? Do we have an agreement on that? I say we we did, and I proved it in my. I don't. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't. Time. I don't think it's possible with today's technology, much less nineteen sixty. Obviously, obviously, they blew up a, a rocket. Well, that was Elon. That wasn't actually <laughs> NASA. No, no, he's in. Yeah. He's. Well, they just went with uh. They just went with Bezos on the moon lander. So we have a new moon lander now, and it's Jeff Bezos's project. But Bezos well, China, really I, China, yeah, China China landed on the moon six months ago. They have a robot. Something like that. They have a robot up there right now, and it saw something weird like in the first week, some square cube object on the horizon. And the next plan after that, we're gonna go to it and find it. And it's gonna, but it's gonna take us like two weeks to get there. Do and we agree it's with, what? Let's see. Do we agree with what this is about to be? What this guy says? Just gonna play it and you let me know. Moon. We can visit other people with air habitation. We can keep track. If there's something very important to be developed from the moon, I'm not sure what it is right now. And I sure think we should identify what it is for America to make such gross expenditures again for human habitation on the moon. We can help. We can join with. Together, we can explore the moon and develop the moon. We should go boldly where man has not gone before. Fly by to comets, visit asteroids, visit the moon of Mars. There's a monolith they're a very unusual structure on this little potato-shaped object that, that goes around Mars once in seven hours. When people find out about that, they're going to say, who put that there? Who put that there? Well, uh, the universe put it there. If you choose, God put it there. Is Maybe it he also said there was water on the moon. Um, I don't know if NASA vetting their astronauts but that really brings up the question like is there really like some brain damage like cte that we don't know about when you go into space like something about some type of astral dust or particles somehow i don't know because that when i saw that i was like i don't know at this point it's like you just have the government now acknowledging ufos exist or they've known about ufos um so you kind of just open up the door to be like all right how much of him being either i don't know he looks like he's he doesn't look high but he's looked like he's speaking with some clarity about something. So I feel like someone just, cause after this, this an article came out that says it was all fabricated. It was all fake. Um, but then, you know, I don't know if they pulled him aside and was like, Hey buzz. Yeah. What the, come on. 
cut you can't be saying that type of stuff he's got a long history of doing that he's got that's that's buzz aldrin he's fascinating that way he said some of the most fascinating things richard dolan did a whole uh episode about the astronauts and he got into aldrin aldrin has just like let slip some of the most great stuff about what they actually saw and what's actually out there uh and they don't like it yeah they take him aside and they say come on buzz but he he's considered he was considered by all the astronaut corps to be the smartest one of the bunch he was the the test pilot and scientist guy and do you think he holds could... resentment against Neil Armstrong because Neil was the first one on the moon? No. No. He was. The, he got to be the first one photographed stepping on the moon. Well, he was the first one apparently to relieve his suit. The yeah, bathroom a, in the suit. He had, he had his first, and also he's the last survivor of Apollo 11. Last survivor. Is he the last one left in the entire Apollo program? Maybe. So he's got his first, you know. There's no room for jealousy. Okay. All right. Uh, I think that's really all I had. I know we didn't have a plan to do anything for this episode or anything, but I thought I sent a message out saying we're doing a space episode, but apparently no one else got the damn memo. But <laughs> no, well, it works. We, we talked about space. Yeah, yeah I enjoyed Sammy, it. Sammy Davis Jr. said, it's always better without a rehearsal. And he was right. That's very true. Um, I appreciate the time you guys gave me to talk about. It. I know I, I I know it's like a lot of people go really super deep into the non-space stuff or the conspiracy stuff on that. But I think this was a little bit more balanced. I just found myself over the past couple of weeks looking through a bunch of stuff. We're being like a lot of issues. I mean, a serious really a issue, even Buzz Aldrin just addressed it, was the budget issue with NASA. Like there's a large amount of money that's being funneling into NASA's program. And there's probably a certain amount that we don't know about that's going – that could be going to a secret side of it, sure. Um, but, you know, I'm – not for that much spending on what their budget actually is. Um, I think if I have the actual, I might be able to pull it up real quick just to show you, give you guys a basis. They, they openly published their budgets. Uh, and I'm just surprised that more people don't know about how much they're actually making. Look, it's all nonsense. There's no way to know if there's a black budget, Anything we try to guess about the U.S. economy is nonsense. We can't guess because there's a black budget. We have no idea what's there. You know, it could be they could be manipulating all of these downturns and you know stock market crashes and and recessions. That that could all be manipulated because there's enough money hidden from us to do that with. It's just don't don't waste time trying to figure it out. Just concentrate on the fact that there's a black budget. And the rest is like just useless to figure out. But how come no, like a two like two thousand five hundred and six million dollars for Spain's launch system to focus on successful completion of Artemis two and preparation required for Artemis three and four, which includes the Block One B configuration and other upgrades, and then one thousand two hundred and twenty five million dollars for the Orion program to finalize assembling and testing the Artemis two crew. Seven hundred ninety four million dollars for exploration. This is all just for Artemis two. And that's not even scratching at the surface because you look at the overall total budget for the whole Artemis project, which just for that one year was provides $3.4 billion to fund agency-wide business capabilities, technical oversight and infrastructure maintenance, and provides $454 million to ensure NASA's infrastructure laboratories and critical facilities are safe, secure, and mission ready. And that's just, I mean, that's just for what we have for 20, is that, you now it's just, 2023 to 2024 well i don't know how they know that we're only five months in um yeah it's a lot of money for yeah, sure who knows anything that's my point who knows anything 132 million dollars for habitation systems to continue developing key technologies to enable the crews to live and work safely in space with initial focus on lunar mission activities include life support systems logistics reduction food and crew health and systems 18 million dollars for crew health and performance Six, dude, what are you talking about? Put some neosporin on it like everybody else and get on with your day. You don't need that much money. I'm just kidding. There's probably, I mean, that food stuff, I mean, the whole procedures and everything that goes into that is probably dangerous, but I'm interested in what that black budget is because there's a lot of stuff that's, where's this money coming from? How do you lose, like you mentioned, Rich, how do you lose like 
a certain trillion dollars of money and then it's not like a big issue. It's like when Blasio, the mayor of New York, he lost like $198 million to a mental health fund. And everyone's like, where did that money go? Like, I want to see your garage. You better show me a damn Lamborghini that's made of gold bricks or something. The hunt for zero. Oh, you know, uh, uh, who was it? Uh, Lassar, uh, the UFO guy, Lassar. He, uh, he had a gold, something like that, gold car like that. Um, um, I apologize, guys. I'm, I'm, I'm up against it. I gotta, I gotta go. Yep. Uh, Joe, promote your links real quick. Uh, Rich will promote yours next and we'll just wrap it. Okay, sorry. Uh, you can get me at uh, Joe Green, JFK, uh, hiddenhistorycenter.org. That's a good one. Uh, but Joe Green, JFK is the main one. And I'll link that in the description. Rich, you want to promote your lecture real quick and I'll wrap up? Bartholomew's, my name, but with B I E W S instead of M E W, bartholomew's.substack.com. I got 30 articles up there now. And I'll link those links in the description. Thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank. Stay tuned for our next episode.